Hi everyone, it's uh, good to speak to you live uh, from here in Scotland Yard at the moment and welcome to this year's themed conference on the Society of Evidence-Based Policing, 10 challenges uh, facing policing over 10 weeks, uh, 12 to 1 every Wednesday uh, here on StreamYard, broadcast live on Twitter and YouTube and from next week to all the Twitter followers in the US as well from the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing. Thanks ever so much for logging on. I hope you enjoy it. Um, uh, and I'm really grateful for Suzanne for putting together <clears throat> the tech that enables this to happen. So we're going to talk through challenges facing policing. Firstly, uh, in a minute, I'm going to introduce Professor Larry Sherman, and he's going to talk about two of the biggest challenges that we're facing at the moment, which is legitimacy. How do police trust the police and how do we better tackle violence? Next week, then, we're going to talk about Jason Roach. Now, Jason Roach uh, is, has, has made his name in policing by self-selection policing, this idea that people who commit small crimes also commit big crimes. And if we can understand the triggers from the small crimes, we can identify the offenders for the big crimes. He talks about the American serial killer um, uh, uh, who was called... Uh, son of Sam, who is identified for parking a fire hydrant. Uh, he identifies the research uh, that says if you park in a disabled parking bay uh, when uh, there's perfectly good other car parking spaces, one in five people had warrants out for their arrest. And he also specialises in nudge policing. So he's a behavioural scientist and he talks around what is nudge policing? How can we influence behaviour? But more than that, uh, how do we move beyond nudge to change people's decision making architecture? Then after that, the next week, we've got Will Hodgkinson, who was a chief inspector here in the Met, who's just moved to Bedfordshire. He's going to talk through the evidence of what's effective in tackling domestic abuse. And he challenges some of the assumptions that we've got. For example, most uh, domestic uh, abuse incidents where people come to harm, they've never come to the attention of the police before. That real harm is concentrated in very few uh, amounts of dyads or couples. And the self-harm and suicide ideation are huge predictors as far as future potential domestic homicide. And what do we do with that? And then from an intervention space, looking at projects like CARA, where you can use cognitive behavioural therapy to deal with low-risk offenders rather than putting them through the criminal justice system. Controversial, I know, but also how focused deterrence can work. Moving on to uh, a piece of work he did here in London where he tried using a randomised control trial, different types of alarm. And by, just by changing a different type of domestic abuse panic alarm, he saw huge increases in uh, arrests and huge increases in offenders brought to justice and then can come back with evidence-based cost uh, benefit uh, assessments. Then we're going to move on to uh, John Jackson and Christian Posh uh, on the 14th of April. This is really good. I, I mean, I had my views challenged in relation to what the police officers can do in the classroom. I wasn't convinced of their effectiveness. But here, this was a pan-England experiment done with NPCC and others, where they looked at police officers delivering lessons associated with drugs, but using the principles of procedural justice. And compared to a control group, and compared to teachers delivering the same presentation, they saw huge effects in increases in trust from kids aged 13 to 15. So it's the first evidence I've seen of, about how school liaison officers delivering in a right way can make a big difference on trust. So that's going to be an exciting presentation. Then we're going to move on to Ryan Doyle. Ryan Doyle is a superintendent in Devon and Cornwall. And you all know, and we know, the amount of time and effort that police uh, officers engage in trying to find people who are associated with missing, missing persons. Um, and the risk of harm that is associated with those. So when we get a call for a missing person, what do we do? How do we grade it? How do we grade our low, medium and high risk? And what should we do as a result of that? He builds on research from Kwok Vo, who was a sergeant in TVP, who showed that in actual fact, whereas a lot of officers think, oh, they're frequent mispers, therefore the harm is low. Frequency massively predicts future harm. And he's taken 96,000 missing person records from Devon and Cornwall and done a quantitative analysis on them and is able to highlight that age and gender are really important when you look at different predictive characteristics of that individual in highlighting where the risk is. So risk isn't just based on a load of predictive factors. You have to wash it against other types of indicators. And as a result, he's bringing together a load of work around how the police can be really sophisticated in tackling the challenge of missing persons. We're then moving on on the 28th of April to violence. And we're really pleased to have Thomas Apt speaking to us. He specializes from the US in uh, sort of low-income, poverty-driven, high-violence neighbourhoods. He's a 
he's a teacher, uh, he's been a prosecutor, he's very empirical, very evidence-based, and he looks at what is actually effective and what is it that the police can do best to tackle violence uh, in low-income, high-violence high areas. Uh, and interestingly, uh, his view is first, let's stop the bleeding. So whilst there's loads of interventions associated with poverty, uh, education, you know, uh, uh, and other socioeconomic factors, he's very much coming saying, look, look, police, you've got a responsibility here to stop people getting hurt and stop getting people uh, uh, killed. And there's a load of things you can do. Uh, and so he concentrates very much on hotspots. David Kennedy's work on focused deterrence, you know, the pulling levers approach, police with sticks and local authority with carrots and, and how you work that way, how environmental design is important. And also from a US context, what he calls violence interrupters. So really looking forward to what he's going to say about violence. Then on the 5th of May, we've got Tom Kirchmeier coming in. Uh, he's an econometrician from uh, LSE. He's done loads of work in policing. He's, a really, a, he's really interested in what big data can do with crime. He did a really neat piece of work from using Greater Manchester Police data, uh, looking at all the statistics that lead into crime detection uh, and all the data. Uh, and it's interesting. I don't know what your view is. If you were challenged around increasing detection rates, what would you do? Most of us, me included, think, well, we need to improve primary investigation and, uh, and investigate better, so more detectives. In fact, he showed from a GMP point of view that the singest, by a long way, biggest predictor of whether you detect a crime is how quick you get there. Uh, and he showed that for every 10% improvement in attendance speeds, you had a 4.7% increase in out uh, offenders brought to justice in outcome rates. Um, so quite, uh, I think, quite uh, counterintuitive to a lot of ways police think at the moment. Uh, you, know, you know, you often hear you just can't keep responding to stuff. Well, in actual fact, if we put more effort into responding quicker, Tom will say uh, we have better detection rates. And he's going to move on to some new re research he's found around what is the difference in outcome rates when you single crew versus double crew. Uh, and he's found big increases in proactivity, big increases in safety. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've spoken about this quite a lot. But in an actual fact, this is the first sort of empirical research based on big data that can highlight where we go there. Then we've got Renee. Uh, she's from the state. She's a, a, a used to be a police officer, Sacramento, and she's just written a new book called um, How We Should Challenge the Way We Think in Policing, 21 Mental Models. She's great. She's a great presenter. I recommend uh, uh, listening to anything that she says. So whereas all the other presentations are going to be focused on tactical implementation of different ways of working, Renee is going to talk around how we think as cops. I'm just going to highlight a couple of those models she talks about. So she talks about system one and two thinking. The system one thinking uh, is when you just make a gut instinct, quick decision. And system two thinking is a more analytical approach. And how often we think we're being analytical, but really we're just going from the gut. She's also going to unpack what she calls first principle thinking, which is basically from the moment we join the job, we are taught in ways of operating as police officers, which we think is effective. And in actual fact, she challenges some of that. She talks about second order thinking, which is the decisions and the tactics we engage in now have huge consequences later. You know, I'm going to introduce Professor Sherman in a bit, but his research in Milwaukee in the 1980s, he's been able to track 30 years later and see difference in death rates in victims and offenders of domestic abuse that are profound from whether someone was warned or whether someone was arrested. That's second order thinking and being able to track the consequences of it. Let no one think that police officers' actions or behaviour only has a small impact. I don't know, the professor might talk a bit more about that in a minute. She's going to talk about how we should not respond to small numbers in variation, uh, how we should deal with performance effectively. And she's also going to talk around the targeting testing tracking model. Then we're going to move on uh, after that uh, in our penultimate presentation to urban youth violence, and that's Professor Simon Harding. Uh, and I don't know what you think about evidence-based policing. A lot of it is when we're trying to understand what works uh, is quantitative. Now, Simon is not asking what works. He's saying, why is this happening? And what is the effect of this happening? Uh, and he's done a sort of ethnographic work but speaking to a load of people kids involved in county lines in Kent and he will really unpack what they're going through um, and what makes them tick how the system works and I'm just going to read a, a, a line from his book and he talks around how people who run county lines are like a, a board and he says but the sophistication of the boardroom is unparalleled by the foot soldiers on page 234 of the book he says 
We use acid as weapons, the extended reach of the knife, the ability to mob up quickly using social media. These all increase uh, competitive advantage. Strike first, ask questions later. Overpower rivals with frenzied attacks. Trust no one, develop a reputation. Once acquired, these advantages cannot be allowed to slide. If in doubt, take the player out of the game, kill the competition. He gives us, us as police officers, I think, a real insight into what people are thinking when they're involved in county lines and will challenge us from a policy point of view around where we go. And then finally, one of the last presentations we're going to talk uh, about on the 26th of May is an inspector here um, uh, called Andreas from the Met. Now, he's a police officer and he's a recreational data scientist. And I don't know what you think about data science, but a lot of us think this is something that other people do. And he's going to really challenge that view for police officers who listen to this conference, as well as analysts. A, he's going to talk about how it doesn't have to be really complicated. And in fact, having a being a data science and a police officer allows us to have a certain amount of insight. He's going to talk about models like regressions and how they important are, how important they are for inferring causation. He's done a great bit of work here in London uh, on um, the disproportionality and using data science and regression methods like that to understand the causes of that and the predictive factors of that. And again, some of these findings are really counterintuitive and, and not what you'd expect. Uh, so I really recommend Andreas's uh, presentation. So basically, I've just given you the elevator pitch of the next 10 weeks uh, from the Society of Evidence-Based Policing. Please log in, please tell your friends about it. Really easy to join. Just go into the SEBP website, uh, register with your name and address, uh, and we'll send through the links to future presentations. Uh, so I really hope you'll stay with us over the 10 weeks uh, and you'll learn a load and take stuff away to challenge how you work in your police service uh, wherever you are. So if I think about two of the biggest challenges facing policing right now, it is probably legitimacy uh, and it is probably violence. And I'm really pleased to have here Professor Larry Sherman now, Professor Sherman is the thought leader around the evidence-based policing movement. Way back in 1997, he wrote a, a great paper that challenged police services around the world. But much more than a thought leader, Professor Sherman is a doer. And so much you can see changing in policing, particularly UK, a lot in Australia, New Zealand and the States, is down to this, method, uh, this method, method that he has proposed called evidence-based policing. Uh, but he certainly inspired my journey in policing and many others. So we're really pleased to have uh, Professor Sherman here with us today. Hello, Larry. Uh, welcome to the welcome to the first SEBP conference for this season. Really pleased to have you. Uh, thanks ever so much for coming. Uh, you've seen in my uh, summary of what we're talking about today. So much of what we've thought about has had a root in uh, the way that you have brought these issues to the fore. So we're really grateful. And uh, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks very much, Alex. And uh, thanks for giving me a chance to invite people to the next SEBP conference, which will be uh, co-sponsored with the University of Cambridge and will occur in Cambridge between the 12th and the 14th of July. That's the uh, uh, second uh, Monday in July for three days. We have tentatively accepted uh, presenters, uh, including uh, Dame Cressida Dick, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Service, uh, Chief Constable Martin Hewitt, the chair of the National Police Chiefs Council uh, for uh, the UK, and um, uh, Dame Sarah Thornton, who's uh, previously uh, held the chair of the NPCC post, is now the Independent Anti-Slavery uh, Commissioner, and, and many others, including increasing numbers of chief officers uh, from uh, the Cambridge course, who uh, in a way started hearing about evidence-based policing for the first time at these conferences. Uh, which uh, began uh, back in uh, 2008. So we're, we're really uh, hopeful that if you can't come in person, uh, that you might find the idea of attending uh, for free uh, by Zoom, uh, like uh, this conference is, but it's all gonna be packed into three days. Uh, and uh, we hope to have lots of original research. We'll certainly have a lot of soul searching about the past year in policing which um, I've been working in since 1971 when I joined the New York City Police Department as uh, an analyst in the police commissioner's office. And I have never seen anything like the last year in uh, my 50 years in working with police all over the world. Uh, the events of May 25th in Minneapolis, where Derek Chauvin is now being uh, charged with murder for having killed 
um, the uh, 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 gentleman who was accused of, of a $20 counterfeit bill passing, uh, not what you might call a proportionate response to have four police officers go to an event like that, but it wound up uh, with a death uh, of George Floyd. And um, police all over the world have been blamed for uh, that action. And the phrase ACAB, uh, all cops are bastards, was uh, written on police cars in Bristol uh, over the weekend. I'm not sure that that would have happened uh, had there not been uh, these terrible events in the U.S., really stemming back to uh, Ferguson, Missouri uh, in 2014 uh, with the shooting death of Michael Brown. In that case, what we saw was a reawakening of the challenge to the uh, disproportionate use of force with people of all races in the United States with the uh, death rate of a thousand people uh, just by gunshot, uh, police killing a thousand people a year consistently since uh, the Congress of the United States refused to uh, uh, create a statistical program for precise measurement of justifiable homicides by police. And so the Washington Post used a crowdsourced way of measuring this, uh, which The Guardian is tracking. And it's always better to have two newspapers rather than one. Uh, but we know uh, from both of those sources that there are consistently high rates of death for police officers in the United States, uh, about 50 times higher per capita uh, of being murdered on duty uh, compared to England, uh, compared to Germany. And uh, all of this uh, has many causes, but we're uh, at last looking at the evidence, uh, which wasn't available uh, even, even uh, 10 years ago uh, on a lot of these important questions. Um, but this uh, all comes together in the uh, events of the aftermath of George Floyd, which in the United States, the Washington Post announced today, uh, has been followed by the single most rapid increase in homicide in the United States since homicide record keeping began uh, about a century ago. We have had um, uh, an increase in 30% of homicide in major cities. We've had doublings in the number of people shot in Minneapolis and New York and elsewhere. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of evidence that uh, police uh, are resigning. They are uh, perhaps staying at, on the job, but not doing uh, the kind of proactive policing, which in hotspots we have good evidence. Uh, and the National Academy of Sciences said in the year 2018, there was good evidence that uh, concentrated use of stop, uh, question and frisk, of vehicle stops, when they were limited to these uh, high concentration of violence areas, that they would be uh, effective in bringing down the number of deaths and injuries uh, from uh, assault. Um, and because those deaths and those injuries have such a great um, uh, level of inequality, uh, I think that the problem itself of high concentrations of murder in certain areas uh, sometimes get, gets lost in the criticism of the police uh, response. But if I can uh, successfully use this technology to share uh, the screen um, and um, have, um, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, let's see if I can allow this. No, it's not going to let me. Uh, what I want to show you is this graph in which the, um, um, in which, yeah, it's not here. We're just going to have a slight pause there while uh, Professor Sherman sorting out his graph. Uh, we may have lost Larry temporarily. We'll just give it another 10 or 20 seconds. Hi from Lithuania, nice to see you. Well, uh, do you know what? I'm just going to talk about legitimacy whilst we wait uh, for uh, Larry. Sorry, uh, his I'm insight back. here is. Oh, okay. wonderful, Larry. I was just about to do a lecture on legitimacy, so I'm really glad you're back. Thank you. No, I, I, what I need is a lecture on how to use live stream, which is a program I've never used before, but it helps us get out on YouTube live. So it's my fault for not having spent a day rehearsing the tools uh, and getting this screenshot right. So I'm going to go without slides and tell you that the rate at which um, 
black citizens of the United Kingdom, or at least England and Wales, uh, are murdered um, is five times higher than it is for whites. For young people, uh, in the most recent year available, uh, 18 to 24, uh, the rate is 21 times higher. And uh, uh, Commissioner Dick has mentioned this many times when asked about uh, what's called disproportionality in stop and search. Um, what she comes back with is a piece of evidence that just doesn't get any attention. It is the disproportionality in the homicide victimization that needs to receive attention under the idea of equal protection of the law. And the fundamental problem of legitimacy that the police face in uh, advanced economies is the inequality of many historical and current circumstances that results in this massive inequality in the risk of being murdered. And the police are somehow magically expected to square the circle of being able to equalize the death rates, not to mention bring them down, uh, while at the same time, uh, using exactly the same policing methods for people whose victimization rates are far lower than the people uh, whose victimization rates are far higher. Now, this is obviously a very politically contentious area, but the fact that the United Kingdom st statistics, the Office of National Statistics, have not uh, published any graphics to, to my research in their history, they've never published any graphics showing the trends in black homicide victimization rates versus white homicide victimization rates versus Asian. And what we did at the Cambridge Center for Evidence-Based Policing recently was to publish the 20-year trends since the turn of the last century in England and Wales, which actually showed something very encouraging, which is that whatever was going on between the turn of the century and about 2012-15, the black homicide rate plummeted and became much closer uh, two or three times higher rather than uh, uh, 10 times higher uh, with the white rate. And all of that seemed to be pushing towards greater equality in crime harm and crime victimization, which one could say is the primary duty of the police while safeguarding human rights. And I think what happened in the, uh, the years following 2012 to 15 when uh, the murder rates for uh, Black Britons start to rise uh, substantially and dramatically. And if you go to the Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing, look for an article by Sumit Kumar, K-U-M-A-R, you will find in 2020 these graphic uh, portrayals of the changes in the violence rates against Blacks, but not against whites. And so that the white Britain goes on enjoying one of the lowest homicide rates of any demographic group in any country on Earth. Um, while that uh, enjoyment is going on, it's not the same for uh, Britons of color. And I think that there is uh, a very important discussion to be had, not about which problem is more important, the problem of perceived uh, over-policing of black populations uh, or the perceived under-policing, which many parents of black homicide victims in London have uh, challenged the police over saying, you're not doing enough stop and search. Uh, and so one of the things that relates to both violence uh, and uh, legitimacy is the question of whether the methods that are used to try to prevent violence by the police, and they're not the only way to try to stop violence, of course, and much of the so-called defund the police movement is about looking at other community institutions uh, and services such as mental health uh, professionals that might be able to reduce uh, the homicide rates. But in terms of the evidence on what police can do, where there has been a, a measure of homicide and there has been a measure of police activity, the one consistent finding in about nine studies from Kansas City, where I, I did the first one, uh, over to St. Louis as the last one uh, done by uh, Rick Rosenthal, former president of the American Society of Criminology, and many studies in between Pittsburgh, um, uh, Indianapolis, um, and even in South America. The one thing that does work, yes, in the short term, but then all police deterrence is pretty much in the short term. Uh, what we see is substantial and significant drops in the homicide rate where stop and search is concentrated in hotspots, which by David Weisberg's research generally constitute no more than 
of the location in the city. So this idea that the violence is happening not everywhere, uh, which was, uh, I think, the basis of carpet policing. When was the last time you saw a cop in your neighborhood? Well, you probably shouldn't see a cop in your neighborhood because it's not having any murders or other serious violence. If we want to equalize the rate of serious violence, the evidence is increasing that we have to concentrate the police deterrence resources in a very small proportion of all places. And by making that concentration, we're doing something that mimics the whole idea, that is to say imitates the whole idea of tears for restrictions on people's liberty in order to save lives from COVID-19. And while the tier system didn't last that long in late 2021, before it was replaced with a national lockdown, at least in England, what's going to happen next seems to be a return to the tier system. And there are even predictions now of COVID-19 pockets, which would be places which for various reasons uh, have not had high vaccine rates, and therefore the COVID rates would persist at a much higher level uh, than, than they are elsewhere. Um, so one of the things that we have to deal with in, in a democracy is this idea of balancing um, the competing good things, uh, which mathematicians will tell you uh, cannot all be maximized simultaneously, especially when there's empirical facts about trade-offs. Uh, we all want everybody to be free to decide whether or not to have a vaccine, but if that, if that person uh, is in contact with uh, lots of uh, highly vulnerable people, uh, then maybe that's uh, got to be balanced uh, against other issues. We hear this every day in the discussions about COVID. We don't hear discussions of balance in policing. We don't hear discussions about balance in violence prevention in a way that would inform the discussion about whether the police are over-policing or under-policing. And it's that balance, that tightrope, which is the key issue for legitimacy um, in certainly in low violence countries like Britain is because no matter what the difference in rates uh, by race in homicide might be, the fact is that Britain's homicide rate is about one fifth, that is 80% lower than the homicide rate in the United States. And let's keep it that way, largely I think to do with uh, not having as many guns um, and certainly not seeing the growth rate in gun ownership that the United States has seen in the last year, uh, which also correlates with a much higher rate of um, everybody getting killed, including police, including citizens by citizens, uh, as well as uh, citizens uh, by police. What do we do to try to get uh, police officers, let alone politicians, let alone the news media or the general public, to understand that the risk of serious violence is not the same everywhere and it's not the same for every demographic group, uh, not the least of which is the concentration of, uh, of homicide in young men uh, who are nobody's favorites because they don't appear to be very vulnerable. Uh, but in fact, they are dying at the highest rate, not only in this society, but in almost every society that's ever been studied. Um, but what we have, I think, is the demand to reassure people who aren't ill that they're getting a vaccine uh, against illness by virtue of having police patrol low crime areas. And correspondingly, in terms of answering calls for service, uh, Alex was talking about answering domestic abuse calls. Uh, we have an enormous amount of time being invested in responding to the uh, cases of domestic abuse in which an offender has already departed the scene. And so one of the experiments that's uh, underway, which I think could transform at least British policing, uh, is a random assignment of video responses to those cases rather than having a police car be assigned and then have other higher priority calls to come in since the offender's already been absent and comparing the average uh, time it takes to actually assist a victim in a domestic abuse case and whether there's any difference in having it dealt with immediately by a white-shirted officer with epaulets and a tie on um, uh, and having a discussion which would be identical to what would happen after three or four hours uh, of uh, uh, travel to get the police car to, to that location. What we're the thinking uh, about generally is the issue, uh, again, not, not unlike tears, but of having 
a much clearer and transparent dialogue with the public about what level of resource investment and indeed what level of restriction on liberty, of intrusion on liberty is appropriate in relation to what level uh, of risk. So for example, even in the Home Office uh, guidance uh, around uh, stop and search, the language refers to stop and search as a serious intrusion on people's liberty. And that's exactly right. If that intrusion is to be justified in a way that is evidence-based, I think we need to go not just to the, uh, the legal uh, guidance as to what is a sufficient evidentiary ladder uh, for that intrusion, but rather a, a much more crime-focused, harm prevention-focused. That's, that's Robert Peel up there uh, in the corner. Uh, and he would have said, what, what about the prevention? It's all about the prevention. Why do we have a justification for stop and search? My view is that the ethics of that would suggest you've got to look at the evidence and not just the legal probabilities in some subjective assessment by judges or lawyers who've never had to make a decision about whether you should search somebody on the street. Now, we have this thing called Section 60, which actually uh, doesn't exist in the US, um, but, but it does exist in this country and is generally invoked after somebody has been killed. Um, what we could be thinking about is what should be the standards in areas where predictably violence has occurred at a very high rate where we've had repeated stabbings. John Massey's research in London showed that the highest risk of knife murder was in areas that had had 15 prior stabbings uh, in the preceding year. And there are such areas in London, even though the majority of all the lower super output areas uh, in London, the smallest measure uh, with the national statistics, um, most of them didn't have a single uh, stabbing uh, in that year, or indeed going back 10 years, just like most areas of London have not had a murder in 10 years. Uh, these geographical concentrations, I think, need to be spotlighted and they need to be put into the public dialogue. And we need to make it part of a spirit of evidence about what is proportionate response. In, in the aftermath of a recent event in uh, South London, uh, in which there were substantial violations of the law about having people gathered together without social distancing and certainly without masks. Uh, a law that was passed by the parliament uh, as the uh, democratic representatives of uh, the citizenry who uh, have the obligation to protect people from death from COVID. And the um, uh, response, which is certainly not been thoroughly investigated, but the response was criticized by a number of politicians as being disproportionate. But I would suggest to you that the way in which you would calculate whether or not making arrests to break up a protest demonstration uh, or a funeral or a, a rave or anything else, the way in which you decide whether the arrests are proportionate or disproportionate has to begin with some knowledge of the risk of death or serious injury that is coming out of those gatherings. And as some members of this age group, the, uh, uh, the, the advisory uh, uh, group for em emergencies, uh, some members have pointed out that the evidence for outdoor transmission uh, is very weak. And even with uh, lots of people crowded together face to face, um, we don't have a number. We don't have data uh, that shows the risk of transmission per thousand people gathered per square meter uh, or various um, regression models that would go along those lines. The problem we have in walking a tightrope is that policing is subject to subjective criticisms from one side and subjective criticisms from the other side. My point about evidence-based policing is not that it's become irrelevant in the cacophony of the past year, but that it's become more relevant than ever that the only way we can begin to discuss what is appropriate in police intervention and intrusions on people's liberty is to proceed in the same way that the debates over lockdowns and tiers of COVID restrictions uh, has proceeded. Not, I must say, not always with the evidence you'd want, such as transmission of COVID through small children who are asymptomatic and their teachers pick it up and the teachers go home and spread it to other people.
Uh, all of that is there in theory. Uh, I certainly haven't seen any evidence on it. And uh, the education issue in COVID lockdowns is, is certainly massive in, in terms of the future of those children. Um, but it, it was an emergency. It had to be decided quickly. And so we still don't have the evidence. Maybe we'll have it five years from now, maybe even two years from now. We don't have it at the moment. And one of the criticisms of the tears policy and the COVID crackdown is the fact that there is not uh, sufficient evidence to support the uh, premise that the intervention is effective and indeed cost effective, that it's somehow worth all of these children missing school, all of these people losing their jobs, all of these businesses going out of business possibly forever, charities going out of business, uh, uh, the causes that they're supporting uh, going un untended. Uh, because of the, the massive consequences of intrusions on liberty that were deemed necessary to deal with the most massive death rate um, in, our, in our lifetimes. Um, but having those big picture comparisons doesn't help at the level of precision where we're trying to decide whether one county uh, should be in tier two and another county should be in tier three. And I think if we come to live with a pandemic, you're going to see more precision of that kind. But we've been living with a pandemic of, of homicide um, in human populations for maybe 5,000 years. Manuel Eisner's research shows that uh, we've had a, an 80 to 90% drop in Western Europe in the last 500 years. That's a very good thing, uh, but it didn't uh, get transferred into uh, the Americas um, with colonial models and lots of guns and more guns all the time. Uh, what we're getting in Britain, I think, is now the level of precision in uh, concern about equity, about legitimacy and seeing the police as being fair in every way, but certainly by demographic differences in gender, uh, and I would argue uh, even more so with respect to race. So if we go to the evidence, it is very interesting uh, to me that the racial differences had not been highlighted um, in government reports. And I'm hopeful that the Office of National Statistics uh, will start doing what um, uh, Mr. Kumar did at Cambridge to show the people of England uh, and Wales uh, what the trends have been in the differential rates of homicide victimization, which are still going up for uh, blacks and especially young blacks in uh, England and Wales relative to whites. Um, what we're not seeing, however, is an emphasis on that issue uh, in things like Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary reports on racial disparity in stop and search. So that, for example, uh, one relatively low homicide uh, police area, one that has not had any black people killed in at least five years, um, thank goodness. But that area has been singled out as having a disproportionately high rate of stop and search per thousand black residents counted in the 2011 census, to which the force immediately responded by saying, yes, but uh, roughly half of the people that we stop in some areas don't even live uh, in this police area. They come from outside. Um, moreover, the census uh, is out of date, and there have been many more people of color moving into the area. Um, but when we drilled down into uh, the 452 lower super output areas, we found that only 177 of them had had at least one person stopped by police who was black and one person stopped by police who was white uh, and one ser serious violent crime against each. So when we got 177 of those areas, with at least some data to work with, we were able to demonstrate that in fact, in that police area, there was a very high correlation between serious violent crime and the use of stop and search. Those of you who know the Pearson's R, is, it's 0.85, uh, with one uh, 0 0.0 being the perfect correlation. So in general, the stop and searches were being used in areas that had more violent crime, but um, what was happening across the county was that the rate was far higher for um, blacks based on population uh, uh, and including in the numerator people who weren't residents. So what we have recommended uh, to that force and we'll be announcing on a seminar uh, on the web free of charge, April 20th, you're all invited. 
to hear about the latest index from Cambridge. No, not the crime harm index, but the risk adjusted disparity index, the index that looks at the rate at which stop and search is used on potential victims of homicide adjusted for the level of violence committed against people in that demographic group. So that we take as the starting point, not the population distribution, but the homicide or the serious violent crime, including GBH, rape, robbery, et cetera. You take that as the starting point and you say, are we under policing that group because their rate is so much higher in victimization than it is for people uh, who have lower victimization rates um, and, uh, and arguably appropriately lower rates of stop and search uh, because that's resource investment on behalf of saving lives that is underinvested relative to the risk of that level of harm. And if we were to think about a national strategy under which stop and search would actually increase in homicide hotspots or serious violence hotspots and be restricted down to almost nothing everywhere else. So, you know, headline, 95% of country uh, to not have stop and search. Uh, that's, that's one headline. The other is uh, stop and search to be focused where it's most needed. Um, and you could have net zero. You could have no change in stop and search. One thing we discovered is that for every um, hundred serious violent crimes, murder, GBH, robbery, rape, et cetera, in Britain, for every hundred serious violent crimes, there are only 77 stop and searches. And whether those are before or after the murder occurs, um, one could argue that's actually under policing in a sense with all the evidence that we have that stop and search, if it's focused in the right places, is able to reduce the risk of murder. So if we want to reduce inequity in murder rates, which drives illegitimacy of the police, if we want to reduce the violence and the total harm to the population, it makes every sense to at least consider focusing those resources where the risk is greatest on the people who are at the greatest risk of being murdered. And to do that on a geographic basis in terms of where these murders are happening, which is what you start with in terms of assigning officers uh, who won't have a quota for doing stop and search, but who will have uh, tracking of the kind of people who've been found with knives, circumstances that might have indicated that they're carrying knives. There's lots of ways to do this. There's also ways to test it with randomized experiments that go uh, randomly assigning each day uh, in a target area to either have uh, intensive policing of that kind or not. And experiments like that in Bedfordshire and Essex uh, are getting very encouraging results, not with stop and search, but just with having a police officer present for at least 15 minutes a day in a hotspot. So forget stop and search and just start talking about an alarm going off if a police car hasn't been to a hotspot uh, in 24 hours. Western Australia found you could go four days without crime going up uh, after a 15 minute patrol visit. And after five days, uh, crime shot through the roof, especially crime harm. It might be easier in Britain it, just to think in terms of uh, a visit a day uh, from the police keeps the serious crime away. But let's just think about the value of evidence-based policing on the larger scale of creating equality in protection and prevention of crime across all of the groups of our population and trying to keep those risks level. They're not inevitable the way death rates from COVID are higher for older people because uh, that, that's something that is uh, biologically constructed. Uh, we didn't design COVID, uh, but we did in a way design our modern society and we can monitor it to see that we have much higher rates of homicide in some places and among some kinds of people than others. If we start with the evidence about how to get that inequality shrunk and to have more fairness and equal protection of the law against violence, I think a lot of other things will fall into place. I'm gonna stop right there and thank you for your attention and invite you again to our webinar uh, on the 20th of April about the Risk Adjusted Disparity Index, a tool that every police agency can use at the very local level of policing to see whether the uh, racial equality using that in index is being sustained in a way that avoids under policing of high risk of homicide and that avoids over-policing of certain minority groups. Thanks very much.
Thanks a lot, Larry. Uh, incredibly interesting and much uh, food for thought. And certainly, I'm sure most people will be booking into that seminar uh, because it's you highlight that whilst there is so much <clears throat> coverage of police tactics, um, it's more important than ever to be evidence based, which I really recognise. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Um, can I put two to you? One, one's from me and there's some online as well. Um, as a police officer, there's some bits I can do to affect the national debate. There's some bits I can't. Um, but you've been at the forefront and some of your students have around how police behaviour can also affect legitimacy. You and, uh, you know, Lorraine Mazzarol and others. I just wonder whether you could just summarise the things that we can do as police officers to build legitimacy. And then uh, Helen Barling, who's actually a Met officer, is asking that DA pilot you highlight in relation to uh, online uh, DA engagements. Uh, where, where's that happening? Well, let, and, let me... and, and final question, if you can remember three is... I can't, you... no. I've done... Okay, I'll come back with the last one in the end. Go okay, on. thanks. No, look, on, on the, the first question, which I've already forgotten, uh, it's about uh, what police officers can do. And the problem, uh, the terrible shame of having a police officer charged with murder uh, on a stranger crime. Uh, and that's, I think, the first time that's happened since 1829 when the Met was created. Uh, I understand from authoritative sources. Um, when you have uh, Derek Chauvin uh, being videoed by people walking by that he's crushing uh, George Floyd to death, uh, the idea of um, this serious misconduct by police uh, generates uh, three reactions. Uh, one is all cops uh, are bastards uh, and we don't differentiate, uh, that's extreme. Uh, another one is that this is just a, a few statistical rotten apples in the barrel, so it doesn't really matter. It's unavoidable. You can't do anything about it. I think both those responses are wrong. The evidence-based response is, let's look hard at the predictors of extreme misconduct, and let's do something like the College of Policing has already done to create the barred list, which doesn't exist in the U.S. You've got cops who've been fired from 18 agencies and they keep getting rehired in other agencies because there's no barred list in, in New Jersey, for example. Uh, and, and I think what every police officer uh, can do to um, promote fair discussion about this is, is to uh, say that Britain's made enormous progress in uh, holding, in, in police officers holding each other accountable. Uh, and that, the, you know, the important thing about um, the tragic Everard case from the standpoint of police holding each other accountable is that the case not only got solved so quickly, which surprised me, but in a way that there was never any question that anybody would hold anything back. Uh, whereas you've seen all these uh, shows about 50 years ago, what might have happened to suppress bad news uh, in the secrecy culture of government in various countries. I think th for the police to be champions of transparency, trans champions of fairness, but also champions of evidence in predictive policing of police misconduct, um, and doing much more than IOPC is doing, which is just one case at a time. But if, if professional standards bureaus were to apply the full principles of targeting, testing, and tracking uh, to minimize police misconduct, to disrupt patterns of misconduct, or shall we say excessive behavior, before they result in uh, George Floyd death, uh, that's something every police officer uh, can do. I, I worked in professional services very early um, and I was training uh, cops doing stings on other cops for heroin deals in New York City. Um, it's, it's not pleasant work, but it's absolutely essential. And in the long run, it cleaned up the New York City Police Department from being uh, corrupt uh, uh, on a widespread basis to uh, now what seems to be much, much lower levels, uh, incidents rather than patterns. So I think we, we all have that opportunity. I'll, I'll stop and go on to question two. Yeah, thanks. I'm I, I just I, and adding to the your your point where you're saying crime concentrates, so the policing response should concentrate. So stop and search should be in areas where there's a high incidence of racial disparity associated with being a victim. It plays exactly. into the the procedural justice point as well, and that's that's the other thing all cops can do, which is explaining when engaged in a stop and search why you're here and that your motivation is good and it's because you don't want to see someone getting hurt and that you know that's the the work of tyler i guess and uh, you treat people with dignity you listen to them but you demonstrate your motivation is good right and that all of us should be doing that when we're engaging face to face exactly but it's going to be easier if the system supports the constable who's doing a stop by enabling him to say 
that this area has one of the highest levels of violence uh, in the mm -hmm. city. And we are concentrating in areas like this. I'm sorry to bother you, but for your safety as well as mine, uh, we're just going to do this procedure. Uh, please stand against the wall. That's what we did in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is a majority black population. We never had a complaint. Uh, in fact, we had compliments saying, well, I'm glad you're doing this here because it's going to make the area safer. Mm. OK, so there's a, a quick question here, which is uh, where's that DA pilot happening uh, in relation to uh, um, engaging online? That's not for me to say, uh, okay. but I will pass it on to the people who are doing it uh, to say that uh, I, I didn't blow their cover, but I, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of interest in it. And the fundamental question is not going to be um, just about the victim surveys, which are going very well with 80% response rates in both the treatment and the control group. Uh, the fundamental question is going to be, uh, is there any increase in risk or harm uh, suffered a uh, risk of harm suffered by the people who are calling the police and asking for a police car uh, to come. Uh, and that's an empirical question, but that's why mm. it's so important that we don't just say, well, we don't have the budget to send cars for all these things, so we're going to do it all online or do it all uh, by phone, by video. Uh, I think we're past uh, the day in which you can get away with not having a trial. And the recent criticism of some of the counterterrorism programs um, has demonstrated that where you got the the advisor on, on legislation saying we don't have a test we don't know that this program is effective how can we let terrorists out in the community when we don't have a proven and tested program with a controlled trial you wouldn't have heard that 10 years ago that's how policy and crime and prevention is changing and the more police themselves demand that kind of testing uh the the better off everybody's going to be and i think if we can concentrate on people whose offenders are coming out of prison after very serious domestic abuse and put a lot more effort into those folks who cause 85 90 percent of the harm from domestic abuse with less than two or three percent of all of the domestic abuse offenders it's the same principle as the hot spots we need to police where the risk and harm is highest and we need to therefore cut back where we can prove it doesn't make any difference whether you send a police car or have a video conversation Mm. And it, it plays to a point that I think you and I have discussed many times around sometimes in, uh, evidence being inconvenient. And I think about a police force that was very heavily criticised for low risk DA calls where the offender had left taking uh, the complaint over the telephone. Uh, and they were very badly criticised. But when the evidence base looked at the analysis of whether I visited or took the call over the telephone, in fact, they found that when you had a telephone call, they were receiving more information from the victim when they had a face-to-face. -face. Uh, it was very counterintuitive, um, but I guess the mechanism is sometimes it's easier to tell someone something over the phone than it is face-to-face. -face. Um, and, and, and to tell them immediately, because as yeah. we know, people don't always say the same Absolutely, thing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. One of your first experiments, Alex, was to look at people who were giving testimony right after the crime versus the next morning when they weren't drunk, uh, yeah. which is an experiment that never got done, but I think it's the timing of the statement is really critical. Yeah. OK, we've probably got time for one more question. Well, there's, there's a, a statement here saying, where can I get more information on the Cambridge University Evidence-Based Policing Conference in July? Uh, you can go to the Cambridge Center for Evidence-Based Policing website, just Cambridge EBP. That's all it takes. And uh, if you can find the search engine, apologies for that, uh, and say that uh, you're looking for the EBP 2021 uh, conference. Um, uh, Dr. Suzanne Kanabi Nicole is going to make that uh, all work seamlessly for you very soon. Uh, and in the meantime, if you can't get it any other way, uh, look me up and email me. Great stuff. Uh, and probably final question, and um, uh, it's going to be an interesting one. So, what are the professor's thoughts on unconscious bias training to reduce stop and search racial disparity? That's the one we're going to end with, Larry. Well, it's an interesting question about unconscious bias training for any purpose, uh, because uh, all of the summaries I see, and I haven't done any original uh, reviews myself, uh, suggest that unconscious bias training uh, has minimal impact on behavior of the people who receive the training compared to those who don't. So in general, based on uh, uh, lots of fields, not just policing, uh, teaching, for example, healthcare, um, there is uh, no reason to believe that unconscious bias training would change the way in which the decisions are made as to who to search and who not to search. But I think the more important question is um, how the search is conducted, the point you made, Alex, uh, 
uh, because most of the complaints of, about both vehicle stops and pedestrian stops uh, has to do with the language, the um, what's seen as overly um, uh, aggressive confrontations of people uh, rather than this softly, softly approach and the explanation, um, which in, in a recent discussion with students, I discovered that what had been the training for stop and search 10 years ago had stopped and people hired recently hadn't been told how to approach somebody in a stop and search. So that gets us into the third T of evidence-based policing, which is tracking. And you might even want to consider somebody's being specialist uh, trained and certified, maybe a college of policing cert certificate in stop and search. So they absolutely know the drill of how to speak to people, how to respond to different kinds of resistance and to create best practices, which themselves can be tested. Um, off the shelf solutions like unconscious buying training are, are not something in my view that's very promising. Mm. And it makes me reflect on the work of Lorraine where for, for breath tests, where you had half the officers saying, blowing that on your way. Uh, yeah. And the other half saying, you know, the hardest part of my job is visiting someone and telling them that their loved one has died because of a drink driver. And when she when she tracked that through around the citizens' reactions to those two interventions, there was a massive difference. One massively supported the police and their interventions for breath tests, and the other didn't. OK, we've got some more questions coming in, uh, which perhaps we'll answer on Twitter. But it, it, it falls to me to say huge thanks to you, uh, Professor Sherman, for coming in. This will stay on YouTube and Twitter ad infinitum. So I'm sure there'll be thousands of watches. Uh, really great to have you. And uh, we look forward to the uh, the presentation on the race, the risk adjusted disparity index. I mean, that's going to be fascinating. And also the Cambridge University Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you all. Thank you.